Awesome. Uh, so my name is Eric Escobar. I work for uh, SecureWorks. And today I'm going to talk to you about software-defined radio replay attacks and how they affect home security systems. So first of all, I didn't go to school for literally any of this. I went to school to get a degree in civil engineering, which is like building bridges, dams, and like big earthwork structures. And I ended up hating it. I was out in the field too much. So I said, you know, I'm out of it. Uh, and then so I, I had an opportunity to join the InfoSec community. And, you know, I kind of started coming to conferences like this, started meeting people, started talking, um, you know, about different things that I've learned and just started Googling around. And now I'm a consultant at SecureWorks. Um, it's one of those things that definitely people say, like, oh, where'd you learn how to do all this super cool stuff? Literally just Google. You know, people say, like, oh, we need free education, free university, free all this stuff. But really, Google is one of the most powerful tools out there. And that's how I've learned almost 90% of what I know. Um, that and coming to conferences like these and meeting people like you guys. Because um, everybody knows something, so it's, it's always good to talk to people and see what everybody else knows. Um, so me and my uh, coworker, Ray, we uh, have won, or so we've won the past three DEF CON wireless capture the flags. Um, and then we got a black badge along the way. So it's been one of those things. We love wireless, and it's something that we, we really like to do a lot. Um, so OK, so we're talking about replay attacks and specifically how they work in home security systems. And so what is a replay attack? Well, it's exactly what it sounds like. An attacker captures a signal and then plays it back at a later point in time. So it's just like if you're you know, outside of a fancy club and they ask, hey, what's the password? And you overhear somebody say the password, hey, you can just go walk up right behind that person, say the password, and it'll let you in just the same as that person did. So it's literally just repeating a radio frequency that you heard broadcast again and again and again to get the same output. Um, and so people often wonder, like, well, that seems really stupid. You know, there's no encryption, there's no security, there's not even a rolling code. How can this be a thing? Well, with cheap Chinese electronics that you can go buy for like 10 cents on the dollar, you know, and get shipped in like a hundred, you know, hundred count bulk uh, straight from China, these things are really easy to code. They're really easy to interact with other things. There's not a lot of, you know, stack that you have to deal with when programming them. It's one of those things that it just spits out a code and then it goes from there, and that's pretty much all there is to it. And so to kind of illustrate this example, uh, we have, come on, there we go. So the way that these uh, sensors work um, typically is you have someone like Steve Carell here, and they're yelling out a value. And somebody's listening on the other end. That's your base station. That's your receiver. That's your, you know, your alarm home system. The problem with this is that Steve Carell, he can yell as much as he wants the same code over and over and over again. And if nobody's on the other end to hear it, there's nothing that happens. The person on this other end, they could never hear him yelling the code, and there'd be, there'd be none the wiser. So if you, you know, happen to take the batteries out of a motion detector or out of a door alarm before it triggered, there'd be no way of knowing that that sensor was offline, which is a part of the problem. They have uh, better security systems now that they cost a lot more, and they're in a lot more industrial situations. And basically what they do is they have kind of like an act and act response. So code will get sent, and someone will say, yep, heard you loud and clear. You know, I got the message. You're good to go. And so this way, if a sensor goes offline, if something happens, you know, then there's some information there to say, hey, that sensor is gone, or hey, that sensor is low on battery, as opposed to the way that all, most home security systems work now, in which they don't listen back at all to their sensors. They don't keep tabs on any of their sensors. They just sit there and wonder, hey, I haven't heard from that sensor in a long time. I wonder what happened to it. You know, I guess nobody's opened that front door in a really long time. Uh, and so that, that's just, that's just kind of how these things work. Um, and, and so kind of going off of that, like I illustrated in the last example, is they use the same code over and over and over again. Now, if you have a, like a new garage door opener or you know, a car that has a, a wireless clicker on it, these typically have what are called rolling codes. And the way the rolling code works is that there will be one code that will get transmitted, and then the next code will be a completely different code that gets transmitted. And it rolls in a sequence that's really hard to brute force because the, the, ne the next number is random in that sequence. And so this, this prevents somebody from just replaying the attack. Now, these still have some other vulnerabilities. There's something called Roll Jam that CME Cam Car came out with. Um, and that, that takes advantage of another piece of how Roll Jam works, or I mean, how a rolling code works. But essentially, these aren't vulnerable to what we're talking about. They're not vulnerable to a replay attack directly. So the way that we exploit these is using something called software-defined radio. So software-defined radio is like you know, normal hardware radio, like a normal uh, piece of equipment that you would buy except a software-defined radio is, is much more malleable. Uh, it has a range of frequencies that it can go off of. You know, it can go somewhere you know, in the sub-megahertz level all the way up into the gigahertz level. Uh, you can have multiple samples you know, per second that you can do. And so there's a ton of different things that you can tune to this. And the reason that you get something like this is to prototype. 
And so I could test, say, say something on 434 megahertz, and then something on 277 megahertz, and then something on 900 megahertz, all with one device. As opposed to what would happen about a decade ago is I would need to go buy some purpose-built purpose -built radio software to tune to something in order to do the testing, which made things a lot more expensive. Um, so let's see. So this is another example of how, of how uh, signals are encoded. So there's typically AM and FM modulation. So if you listen to the radio, right, there's, you know, that's where AM and FM get their name. And then the type of, that these cheap electronics have is called on-off keying which is a, a type of um, frequency modulation. And so you can see that, that it has zeros and ones indicating you know, where it goes high and low, and then, or sorry, amplitude modulation. And so when it goes high and low, that's when you'll notice, okay, that's how they're encoding the data in the stream. And so it's, it, once you decode the signal, you're basically just getting you know, beeps and boops that go in one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. And if you replay that signal exactly, it's gonna work exactly like it does for a sensor or for an attacker. So now there's one really easy way to do this. So a lot of times you can get a software defined radio. You can look at a plot. You can see all the data um, you know, that's coming in. You can, see, you can try and see, OK, what kind of modulation is this? You know, what the frequency is? Uh, and all the different aspects that this radio transmitter will have. Or you could turn your device over. And on the back of it, every country requires some sort of ID. In the United States, they require what's called an FCC ID. And if you look on the back, you can just go look this up and go online, and you can just see all the characteristics of that radio, because, because by law, it has to be available. Um, and so the hard way would be actually analyzing the signals, looking at the FTT plot, looking at the waterfall display, and seeing, OK, what's the modulation? What's the frequency? What's the bandwidth? Whereas if you just go look at the FCC ID, that's all you need. And so if you go to, if you go to FCC.io, uh, you can just type in whatever the FCC ID is on the back of your device. And then you can download all the test reports, the user manuals, you know, the chips that they're using. So it takes all of the guesswork out of it. Now, it's kind of cheating from the standpoint of you know, you're not actually black boxing it. You can see what's going on because they provide it to you. And so a lot of times, if you're you know, driving by and you see on a pole that, oh, hey, there's a box with an antenna on it, if you look underneath it, typically there's going to be some sort of ID. You can just Google that ID and find information like this. So it takes a lot of the guesswork out of trying to figure out, oh, what's that doing? And instead of sitting there for days and days with a software-defined radio trying to you know, key on when, you know, when the frequency gets released or what intervals and what frequency and you know, what kind of modulation is there, uh, you can just look at this. And then, boom, you have all of that information at your fingertips. <coughs> Um, and so here's some of the software that I use to, to do these attacks. And I'll go over uh, you know, step by step how I do them with a couple of different of these. So HackRF tools, um, Michael Osman, he makes the HackRF. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. If you haven't, it's an awesome software-defined radio. It has a huge, wide range of frequencies. It's half duplex, and it's one of these things that for $300, you can do pretty much any challenge, or you, know, you can break into pretty much anything you want to with some $300 piece of equipment, which in the past, this would be something that you know, would be reserved for only multiple thousands of dollars. And so he has this hacker of tools, which is built in. Um, and so it allows you to use that. Then there's also, if you are running Windows, SDR Sharp. Uh, it has a lot of built-in tools where you can like, see the radio codes that are coming off of airplanes. So you can see as an airplane goes by, they beacon out their radio frequencies, their radio signals. And it's one of those things that you can see, oh, hey, this, this plane is coming in from you know, Las Vegas. It's coming in from the UK. And here's its altitude, its wind speed, and all this stuff. And that's, that's all. You can just see it all in SDR Sharp. So that's one of those really cool things. Uh, there's RFCAT and OOK tools. So we're talking about cheap electronics and how they do on-off keying. That's what I use OOK tools for. It's perfectly suited to do that. Uh, and then there's RFCAT. RFCAT's uh, another thing that works for the dongle that I'll discuss later. And then the huge Swiss Army knife of all of them is GNU Radio. It's the biggest beast that you have to master in terms of how difficult it is and um, all the different plots it can generate. And there's just so many options that it's one of those things that it's, it's, uh, there's, there's a ton to it. But once you master it, you can do pretty much anything you can imagine with it. So this is what I was mentioning before. The HackRF goes around $300. It has a huge range of, uh, of bandwidths that it can go from. And it's half duplex. And what half duplex means is it's kind of like a walkie-talkie. You can either talk or you can listen. You can't do both. A uh, cell phone is a good example of full duplex. And there are software-defined radios that can do full duplex, but they're multiple thousands of dollars. Whereas the HackRF, it's a great entry level. And you can still perform many of the attacks that you could with anything that's multiple thousands of dollars. Um, and Michael Osman has a free uh, series that I'll show in the links 
later on. Um, and it's a free, hey, this is how I use this, going from I don't know anything about software-defined radio to where I can perform these attacks in probably about two days. And if you've ever gone to Black Hat, you know, it's a multiple thousand dollar year conference to get into. He does a two-day class at Black Hat. That's exactly what's that are online. Um, so it's a really good resource just to get started and something that people spend up to 10 grand to go take. Uh, and then you have the Yardstick one. It's, uh, it's cheaper. It's around $145, um, but it has a narrow range of frequencies that it can do. But if you're looking just to get your feet wet, $145 is extremely cheap to get, your, uh, to get started in it. So before I mentioned OK tools, and this is using uh, this Yardstick one. So if you have this Yardstick one, you can pair it with your laptop, a Raspberry Pi, pretty much any Linux-based computer, and you can install OK tools. And again, there's links at the end of the slide, so you can see where to download it and how to go from there. But this is literally all you have to do in order to perform one of these attacks, is you do OK tools, signal record, and this is multiple lines, but this would normally just be in one line in, a, in like a Linux command prompt kind of a deal. Um, so you, have, you record the signal and the frequency, that's in megahertz. Uh, the frame count, that's just how long, like, like how many seconds it's going to record. And then the destination, that's the file that it's going to go out to. And so basically you say, OK, I'm going to start recording. You hit what button that you want to record, kind of like you're programming a universal uh, TV remote. And then all you do is when it's done, then you can play back that file as many times as you want. And so that's all that is required for one of these attacks. And so you're talking for $145. You can break into a lot of security systems. You can break into a lot of things that you normally wouldn't really think of. And, and I have a lot of videos that I'll show you here in a little bit that kind of illustrate how terrifying it is that some things still use really, really cheap and terrible programming. So now if you have the HackRF, this is the same way to do it, just a different command line. So this is using the HackRF tools. And basically what you're doing is you're recording to whatever frequency in megahertz. Uh, or this is the frequency in megahertz, and that's the file. And then so the dash R is to receive, dash T is to transmit. And that's the frequency. And so that's all it is. You just catch the signal and play it back. And you can get way fancier with this if you use something like GNU Radio and uh, mess with all those blocks. But to get started, this is honestly the easiest way to do it. And it doesn't really require any knowledge past you know you're receiving a signal on a certain frequency, and you just want to transfer the same signal on the same frequency. So if you were to throw out the output of, of um, something that you recorded into an audio player, it would kind of look like this. And this kind of goes back to what I was showing you before with the on-off keying. As you can see, you know, highs and lows and the beeps and the boops as they go through. Um, and so this is just kind of what it would look like if you were to plot it up, just to give you a visual representation of it. Uh, let's see. There we go. Uh, so, okay. so what you can also do with this too is because you can transmit, you can also do jamming attacks. And so what happens is we go back to the example of the sensor just yells at the base station to say, hey, someone opened the door. Hey, motion was detected. Well, if you play a sound or if you just play anything on that frequency louder than that door is transmitting, then that base station has no idea that someone's yelling, hey, the door opened, or hey, the motion went off, or hey, your smoke alarm's going off. It has no idea that anything happened. And so it's one of those things that if, if, you're, if you realize, hey, somebody has a vulnerable alarm system, you could just play this. Uh, you know, you could just play a jamming frequency or play a music or just create noise on the same frequency that those transmitters go off of, and your base station will never hear the door open. It will never hear a motion alarm go off. It will never know that your smoke alarm went off. It basically just disrupts the communication between the base station and the sensor, which is kind of terrifying that you think for $145, you could essentially break into somebody's you know, house, and they would have no idea. Um, and then you also have replay attacks. So what I was saying, off, uh, saying before is, you know, replay attack. So I can make somebody think that, hey, all of their doors opened at once, all of their doors closed, all of their windows got open. You know, if I, if I can just sit there for a while and know this is what each sensor does, I can just program those and drive somebody crazy so much so that they don't trust their alarm system. You know, they just think, ah, it's being buggy. And so when you actually go to open a door, then they'll think, ah, I don't trust it. Like, this thing's been going on the fritz for a long time. Um, and so, yeah, if you replay that same string over and over again, the base station thinks that the sensor went off. And what I showed you before in the earlier examples, if we go back to it, uh, let's see. We're just recording these to files. So you can script this up however you want, and you can replay the files back at any time you want. You can create a bash script, Python script, whatever you want. You can create it and script it up to work however you want it to. And because these things work with the Raspberry Pi, this is something you can just deploy and just program it to at any point in time. You just want it to go off. Um, so it's one of those things that you can use it for pranks, and you know people could use it for some real harm, and they have. Let's go back to where we were. 
Um, so let's talk about some of the sensors that are vulnerable to this. So this is a cheap sensor that you can get online. Uh, a lot of people have them to interface with their alarm system. Say you already have an existing alarm system and you want to add some cheap unit. This is typically one of the cheapest ones that people buy. Why? Because it's wireless and it comes with a little 12 volt battery in there. Um, and you just mount it up either with tape or you know, screw it in your wall. And it just says, hey, the door is open. You program them into your alarm to say, anytime you know, alarm that you see this signal, know that this door open. And so that's, that's all the programming that happens. And again, this kind of comes back to why they're programmed the way that they are. Because they're such cheap electronics that they need to be able to interface as easily as possible with an existing alarm system that's already there. This is not the top of the, you know, top of the line market. Even though things that are on the top end still suffer from some of these vulnerabilities. Uh, so here, for example, is like an augmented um, motion sensor. And so I'll play this video. Hopefully the demo, demos work. So this is, you'll notice the motion sensor went off with the battery completely unplugged. And so that's me just performing a replay attack of, hey, look, there's not even a battery in there. How is that even happening? So it's one of those things like, okay, you could drive somebody crazy. Now on the inverse, this is it jamming. So you can see, okay, the first time it works, and you'll notice there's a little red light right here that'll go on here in a second. Uh, come on. So you'll notice that light comes on, meaning that motion got triggered, but you'll notice it's sitting right next to it and nothing is happening there, and it's plugged in having power. So that's, that's the kind of transmission power you're talking about, is clearly you know, the antenna that I have is somewhere back off here, and they're as close to each other as they could possibly get, and still nothing's happening, still they can't communicate back to one another. And so, okay, you think, a door open, door closed sensor, who cares? Motion sensor, all right, I guess that's kind of troublesome at some points, but hey, whatever. But then you look at like some nice residential community that has one of these gates. Well, the problem is everybody has a clicker to these gates. So all they need to do is just sit and wait for somebody to, you know, you know, open a gate. Whoa, there's, there's audio to this. And you can see, oh, okay, this is just using a Raspberry Pi in that yardstick one. I can open a security gate. And so I can come back at any time during the day, any month, any whatever, and that code is always going to work because it has to work for everybody that lives in that community, in that subdivision. So now effectively I can open any one of these gates that are out on the market. And I mean, this is not a neighborhood that you know, you'd expect to have uh, you know, riffraff coming into. So if somebody just bought you know, less than $200 worth of equipment, they could let themselves into these kinds of security gates. And this goes into things like covered parking. You know, if you're in a large suburban area where you know, maybe there's a metal gate that lets you in and out of parking, um, pretty much anything that's automated that uses a gate or some kind of security system like this with multiple people going in and out is vulnerable to some attack like this. So then something else that's vulnerable is smoke alarms or smoke detectors. And people think like, okay, why does a smoke detector need to be wireless? And it's so that it can turn on all the other alarms. So if you know, so basically this is designed for like say a, a large house or like a large office building. And when one, you know, one corner of the office, you know, say somebody burns popcorn in the kitchen and it wants to alert all the other, you know, smoke alarms in the vicinity, they all communicate via radio saying like, hey, I'm shouting that there's a fire, so all of you guys should just shout that there's a fire. And so you could essentially evacuate a building and cause panic in a building. Now you think about, hey, this could be that terrible. Now if you're a burglar or somebody who wanted to get in, maybe you're on a red team and you want to perform a pen test, what better way to get everybody out of a building or have somebody not pay attention to you than to turn off all of their alarms wirelessly? And you can do this from, you know, from the car. If you have a big enough transmitter, you can do this from blocks and blocks away and no one would be the wiser. Especially because if you know what model they have, you know, say you just go in there and you look and say, hey, I know what model this is. You know, you go back, do some research, go find the FCC ID, and you know, you say, oh, okay, I already know what this can transmit on. You can pretty much just, just know exactly how this is gonna work. Now, this is one of my favorite ones, and now this is, a doorbell is not really a security device. Sure, somebody comes and opens their door, but this makes for a hilarious prank. When you can doorbell ditch someone, and they have no idea that they're being doorbell ditched. And you can just sit you know, a couple hundred yards away and just mercilessly ring somebody's doorbell. And they can stand out there by their doorbell and you can still ring it and they will have no idea how this is happening. <laughs> and again, for $200, I mean, you can make it even cheaper for, for, uh, you know, for less than $200. But I mean, just as a general base setup or you just buy the transmitter and, and keep it with you in your laptop, I mean, that, that's almost worth it just for the prank alone. I'm just saying. So, so again, uh, the next thing is shock collars. And you think, okay, this is not necessarily a security device, except I would disagree in that your dog, 
your dog is a security device. And if you can mute the dog, uh, you know, there's bigger problems there. Now, this actually was stemmed out of a or out of a challenge that was at DEF CON's wireless CTF. And the way that it worked is two contestants we do kind of like a like a duel. So every or so two people would go back to back and they would have a shock collar strapped to them, and they would have to go to their laptops and they would have to try and shock the other person first. <laughs> Which sounds terrifying, but it gets even worse. And really, so we're going, uh, let's see, do I have it in the slides? I don't have it in the slides. But basically, you see how, how right here, how it shows that there is a, uh, um, a 100 there? That's actually a 255-bit key space. So even though the transmitter only goes up to 100, you can technically transmit 255, so 2.5 times what could put a German Shepherd on its butt. <laughs> and that's what you're dealing with when you go with it. And to make matters even worse, is so since this is a replay attack, the person who was in charge of setting up the, the challenge, they basically set it up in such a way that they didn't know what, or you didn't know what buttons were being pressed. So essentially, what happened is you could be shocking yourself or you could be shocking the other person, <laughs> which added, added to it. So, so it's just one of those things that you think, okay, this is really funny in the context of like, okay, we're at DEF CON and like, somebody's going to get shocked, somebody's going to hurt, and there's going to be a hilarious YouTube video that's going to be posted somewhere later on. But, but in all honesty, if you think about this, if you know that somebody's dog uses this and you want to go try and break into their house, what better way to make that dog submit to you than to have a portable you know, shock collar on them already that you can control and you can wield. So in all seriousness, this is a security issue. If you can make somebody's dog stop or leave you alone and they think, hey, this, this dog is going to protect my backyard, that's actually not the case. You can make the dog submit. And, and I mean, and these are like, I think the number one dog shock collar is on Amazon. You know, and so you think like, okay, well, you know, what's out there? So if you go to this, uh, uh, this GitHub right here, this is one of the guys that has a great tutorial and a great write-up. So if this is something you're interested in and doing these replay attacks, he goes through it, you know, from explaining what literally every one and every zero means from, you know, identifying what collar it is to identifying, hey, this is, you know, what vibrates it, this is what makes it make a sound, to, you know, what makes it, you know, actually do the shocking. And he goes through step by step, piece by piece from how the modulation works, you know, it goes in the way depth. So the, this is Tim, he's a great guy, and I, I really recommend that you guys check this out because um, he was definitely a mentor to me during this event, even though I eventually had to compete against him in it. So I don't, I don't just like to break things, I also like to build things. And so that's why, you know, if you know the weaknesses associated with how some of this stuff works, you can build your own stuff pretty cheap. So basically what you see here is this is if you wanted to make your own super cheap alarm system, knowing what you know now. So you have a receiver. So this is just a high-powered receiver, so you can receive something from a couple hundred yards away, an Arduino, and a Raspberry Pi. And with that, that's your entire base station that you need for an alarm system. So you could totally just buy this. Like, there are things on the market you could buy this for. But again, I like to build things. The hardware is really cheap. And you can adapt this to any number of projects. So maybe, maybe you just don't want to see when a door opens or a door closes. Maybe you just don't want to know when um, you know, uh, there's motion detected outside. Maybe you want to detect how many times your neighbor is shocking their dog. This could do that. This could detect any of these you know, transmissions going. You could use it as an intrusion detection device to where, hey, maybe somebody is, is trying to do a jamming attack. You could use this to also discover, hey, somebody's performed a jamming attack because I can't receive my own signal. So it's one of these things that uh, you, know, you can use things that you've learned that you've broken to be constructive, um, and they're easy to integrate with other projects. So basically, in a nutshell, uh, this is how it works, is you have, you know, you have your, your door alarm, let's say. Signal goes off, just like we talked about before, where it'll just you know, scream out one signal. You receive that, goes to Raspberry Pi, dumps it into a cheap little SQLite dead database. When I say cheap, like light on resources, totally free. Um, and then you can have it you know, SMS, email you, whatever you want. Totally programmable. You know, it's, it's super easy to do. And there's like, if, if you're not like a hardware guy, uh, there's like four wires, and actually one of those wires is a USB. So it's, it's as simple as it gets. This is literally the wiring diagram of it. Um, and so kind of talking about these sensors and other ones that are also vulnerable. So we, we talked about, you know, the smoke alarm going off. We talked about the motion alarm. We talked about the doorbell and the door sensor. But there's tons of other sensors that are out there on the market like this. This is like a, a leak detection. So, you know, maybe somebody thinks that they have a sump pump in their basement and they have a leak. Uh, this will detect that and that alarm will go off. Think if somebody had a remote property out in the middle of nowhere and you triggered their leak detection. 
Now all of a sudden that person's going to have to go like to say their, you know, their family cabin because this leak was detected. And so these just this insecurity is one of these things where people don't necessarily associate it with with what the damage could actually be. And people think like, hey, it's cheap electronics. I know what I'm getting myself into. But really, you know, the whole spectrum of the implications that can happen really aren't addressed that well. So if you ever want to look at, uh, um, you know, this is that 434 alarm system that I made. So it's just a real quick and dirty, you know, this is how you make your own little Raspberry Pi so that it can receive a signal so that you can, you know, pretty much do whatever you want. It's online. If you want to mess with it, by all means, my email's on there if you want to email me with questions about it. Again, this is a fun project for me, but it also underlay, underlies how something that's weak, if you use it in the proper way, you can make it into something that's a little bit better and, you know, surf your own devices, right? Like maybe you already have one of these broken alarm systems, right? So, so say this alarm system doesn't work or, you know, that you're worried about it now being jammed, that you're worried about it being replay attacked. Well, if you build this, now you can have your own intrusion detection system saying like, hey, I can monitor when, you know, any alarms go off if I didn't do it. I can, I can know if somebody's performing a jamming attack because this is basically a listener that's smarter because you configured it. And again, they totally sell things that are on the market like this, but this is cheap and it's kind of fun. So now let's talk about some of the features that would make this more secure and, and some things that you want to look for if you're going to go buy a new alarm system or a new home security system. So pretty much what you're looking for is you're looking for communication between the sensors. So before what would happen, again, we talked about it, is that that sensor, it's just yelling. It's just saying, hey, this door is open. And if nobody's there to receive it, it doesn't know. But there are some sensors now that what they do is they talk back and forth. So if you look at something like Z-Wave or Zigbee, uh, these types of protocols, they know if a sensor is gone, if a sensor is missing. They, they keep track of where that sensor is. So it's one of those things, it might be a little bit more money, but it's a lot better to know that, hey, this sensor dropped off and you get a notification saying, hey, maybe that sensor's battery died or maybe somebody, you know, smashed that sensor. And, and knowing that, that piece of information is, is more powerful than just assuming that, like, well, maybe it's there and nobody's opened that door in a long time. Um, the other thing that's coming out is, or that I guess is out now, are mesh networks. And the way a mesh network works is so, um, so if you can think of, of this, there's a base station and then all your sensors around it. So typically your base station is centered, you know, in the middle of your house and all of your sensors are spread out around the yard and, you know, in the, around the house and the perimeter. And it works more like a central point and, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, devices out in the perimeter that all talk to a single device. Well, with mesh networks, you can have multiple devices all talking to each other, all relaying, all relaying information to each other. The benefit to this, is that there's no device that can get taken out, um, you know, or destroyed or damaged because the mesh network will then talk to multiple devices. And so if one device, say, loses a connection, gets broken or something like that, uh, all the communication channels will basically form around it. And so you'll notice that th they've been using these in a lot of, um, a lot of larger cities that have to have interconnected, you know, devices like, say, uh, if you have, like, you know, there's all the smart meters, they have something similar to this. Um, and then one thing that we really didn't talk about at all is encryption or just any encryption at all. You know, it's one of those things that, that a replay attack, if there was any encryption at all, you know, any kind of randomized encryption, there's absolutely no way that I would be able to perform a replay attack because any good encryption would randomize every time so that even if there was a replayed string that went over and over, to me, it wouldn't appear that anything would happen. It would appear to be ran, you know, random data going across the wire and I couldn't replay it at all. So, so, I mean, good encryption is definitely something that you want, um, but that's one of those things that it's kind of hard to know, right? How do you know what's a good encryption, what's a bad encryption? Because you look at the box of anything or you look at any security vendor and they say, government level encryption, you know, and, and a lot of times those are junk. So it's one of those things that one of the best things you can do is just, hey, if you're going to try and break it, you know, pen test it yourself. Say, vulnerabilities in X security system, right? And just do 10 minutes of Googling and see, are there any known exploits against it? Um, but typically, if there's some encryption, uh, you know, that's going to be way better than something that you could just normally perform a replay attack against. Um, and next is intrusion detection. This is something that you really don't see in the wireless space, but there are some higher end uh, devices that have this, and typically they're used in government. And, and really, with intrusion detection, what you get is if somebody does perform a jamming attack, if somebody does try and do a replay attack, if somebody does try and add a node into your mesh network, <laughs> If somebody does try and brute force an encryption key, intrusion detection will prevent that. And that's something that's not really out, but you have the tools if you go back and look, you know, if you go back and look at these slides, hey, this with this, oh, not with that. 
with this repository, this is something that you can roll your own in a matter of hours, right? I mean, you have all the tools at your disposal if this is something that you want to do. Um, and, and that's something that really isn't out on the market, is intrusion detection for all these wireless sensors. Because you think about just in your life in general, if it's not wired and it's some device, think of all these IoT devices that are on the market now. I mean, people have Fitbits. You know, those are Bluetooth. I can identify a Fitbit from, you know, maybe 50 meters away. You look at, you know, stuff like, I've seen an insulin pump that's Bluetooth. That's kind of terrifying when you think of, you know, some of the vulnerabilities that are associated with Bluetooth. And so it's not just security devices in general, it's all devices that use wireless. And this is, this is one of the most basic attacks that you can perform against it, but you'd think that in the year 2017 that we would have a way, you know, around it, or that this would just be some laughable thing that happened in the past. But you can literally go to any major department store today and buy a security system off the shelf that's vulnerable to literally all of this. Um, and so it's just one of those things as a consumer to be wary about, as a hacker, you know, to be interested in, and just as just as a more informed citizen to just know what you're getting into. So now talking about learning, learning a little bit more and, and how all this stuff works, um, you can go to greatscottgadgets.com slash SDR. And this is a full, this is that full two-day course that I was talking about with Michael Osman. This class you can pay thousands of dollars for, but he offers it for free. It comes with homework, it comes with lectures, it comes with basically how to set up your hack RF from the ground, you know, from the ground up. Then RTL SDR. This is a great website because they deal with almost anything that's radio. If you want to you know, send a, uh, a signal to the moon and reflect the signal off the moon back to you, you they'll show you how to do it on this website you know, using just, just normal hardware. There, there's some crazy things that you can do on here that people just people find it fun, right? I, I find it fun. And when you, you know, people love to share what they found, love to share, like, hey, do you know how this works? Uh, there's been a lot, of, a lot of specifications that have come out that you know, were closed and people didn't know really how they worked or you know, what it was, but you know, a community like this, people you know, can crowdsource and fit, you know, reverse engineer some protocol on how it works and open up some of this lockdown proprietary signaling and software that's out there. And again, that's my GitHub repo. I, I'm not a programmer, I'm a hacker. Um, so if you want to look at it, by all means. Uh, you know, I'd love any comments, but also just fun. Um, so that's it about now. Does anybody have any questions? It's it's not hard at all. Actually, one of the features, if you look into that OOK tools, you can set a, a higher you know a higher limit or an upper limit and a lower limit, and just have it scan all through there, just back and forth, just waving back and forth, till eventually you pick something up. And basically, what it'll show you is it'll show you frames caught, so data caught, and it'll show a number. And so you can say, okay. Um, you know, because it's over a bandwidth, right? So you have, you have signaling that's, that's over a certain band. And maybe you got a signal, you know, on the upper band, so say it's, you know, one, one megahertz wide, just as an example, and you're on, you know, the, the upper bound of it. That, might, that, that may not be a great signal, but the way that it works is since it scans all the way through, it can say, okay, you got one frame here, three frames here, seven frames here, three, and then one. So you can see kind of the peak and where the center line of that frequency is. So just setting something up to scan on like something like cheap, like a Raspberry Pi or Arduino, super easy. Um, and it's just one of those things to just read the documentation and you know it's all right there. Um, it's pretty easy. Can you create a small portable clicker like the one that you're replicating with the laptop? Absolutely, and and in fact, one of the projects that I'm working on is so you know I, I have a bunch of family that lives in like you know they have gated communities or they have X or they have Y they have Z so I'm looking to to put a GPS module in there so when I just drive up it knows hey you're within the vicinity I'm just going to start spraying you know that code somewhere so I don't even need to do anything I just drive up and it just lets me in and it just knows based upon my GPS you know what could I do. I haven't done it yet, but that's something that I'm working on. But yeah, you can, I mean, and you figure one of those transmitters, you know, you, if you buy, so if you know exactly what the frequency is, you can typically get a transmitter really cheap. So for 434 megahertz, they sell those sensor, or they sell those transmitters for like $2 on eBay. So if you know this is the frequency that I want to use it for, you can buy an Arduino and that deal and, you know, uh, and a battery for like $4 and make your own no problem at all, um, you know, and just, and now you just have one that's programmable, right? So if you ever lose one or if you ever just want to mess around, you have a literally $5 deal that's programmable that you can make yourself. What else? Oh, what's up? If you run the doorbell lantern with the Raspberry Pi, is there a reason you have the Arduino? Or 
Uh, so, so yes, I could use the GPIO pins. The reason that the Arduino is there, so Raspberry Pi, so this, this is going to get into a little bit more advanced of a talk, but whatever. Um, a Raspberry Pi has what's called 3.3 volt logic, meaning the processor can handle a voltage of 3.3 volts across the pins. Uh, an Arduino, on the other hand, can handle 5 volts on its pins. And I have multiple receivers, multiple transmitters, and they can use anywhere from 5 volts to 3 volts. And so typically the Arduino is there if my if whatever you know transmitter I'm using uh, has five volts or if it has three volts and I'll just take it out and go directly to the GPIO pins. I could also use a logic level shifter, but it's just one of those things that that for a lot of people it's easier uh, to, for them to get an Arduino and the transmitter because then they can do a project just with that or you know have them all three in a line. So it's one of those things that is more of a modular system and less of a purpose built system for what it is. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's and, and that's one of the things too is that uh, the Arduino goes over serial, and so it's easy to process serial data, right? It's it's super easy to do that, and and this way I can just you know swap it in, swap it out. It's modular, so if I'm developing something or messing around with something, hey, you just pop it in right there. But if I were going to build something purpose built, purpose built, I would do exactly what you did, right? Have it just interface directly with the GPIO pins, you know, put it in a nice little box and then call it a day and not have to worry about the modularity of it. Yeah, absolutely. You can do Pi Zero Wireless. The only reason that I like the Pi 3 for doing this kind of development is because it has four USBs on board. Um, and that's, that's really the only reason. If once you have like whatever you're going to make, you know, all set up and good to go, you could absolutely use, you know, a Pi Zero um, to do pretty much anything that you want for it. Again, I just like I just like the four USBs just because it makes it nice and convenient, and I'm not worried that I'm gonna like snap, twist, or break something, you know, right when it happens. So, what's up? What sort of range can you get with the HackRS on four thirty three? So legally or illegally? Because I mean, <laughs> because I mean, like, uh, so if, if you wanted to receive, you get a dish antenna and get it from like a mile away, like or more than a mile away. So it's kind of stupid how far you can get. Really, the limitation there is not the HackRF; it's the antenna that you're using. And for transmission-wise, you could dump as much power into an antenna as you want, and I mean, you could cover an entire city if you really, really wanted to. I mean, you get caught pretty quickly, I'm sure, by some three-letter agency, um, you know, and get put into a dark prison cell that doesn't exist. But it's one of those things that you know you're limited really by legality and the power level that you want to transmit and the hardware that you want to use to receive. But it is one of those things I've, I've seen people that have used 430, 434 megahertz in the United States. You know, with specially crafted antennas transmitting at legal frequencies that can get over 10 kilometers, like no problem in open air. You know, I mean, they're using like butterfly antennas and dish antennas to send and receive, and it's line of sight, you know, on a clear day kind of a thing. But it's one of those things that, I mean, we're talking just normal level transmissions of like a couple of milliwatts. We're not even talking in the watt range yet. So it's one of those things that it's really the limitation of your equipment. But, but typically, if you're going to just mess with a general sensor and like, um, you know, one of my general receivers, you get probably about 100 feet, 200 feet, um, depending on, really really what it depends on is the thickness of your walls and what your walls are made out of. If your walls are made of like chicken wire and like, you know, RF shielding material, you're not gonna get very far. But if it's, you know, just generic home construction, you know, that has, you know, plaster um, or something, or then, you know, brick or something like that, that radio can transmit pretty well, you'll get farther. So it's one of those things, it depends, but you can get, you can get far enough, right? That's what they're designed for. You absolutely could. So, so there's so I, I mentioned Sammy Camcar before here, and he he figured out. Um, so you have those garage door openers, right? And they have a rolling code. He figured out a way to basically brute force that. And so there was I think 4,096 possible possible codes, and he figured out a way to do that to squish it all into the gnome byte space key space whatever to basically do in like 10 seconds. He could open up any garage door ever. You know, and so he'd like test it and they open up. I mean, he has a great video on it if you want to go Google that. But yeah, th that's something you can absolutely do. Like with the dog collar, for example, um, you know, there are, I think, four bits that are the unique identifier of it. And so you could basically brute force those bits and the shocking frequency to just shock any dog collar on that frequency without having to know its ID. So, so there, there, yeah, I, I, the answer is yes, you can absolutely do it.
So yes and no. Those get, those get weird, especially in the United States, because that's what a lot of our phones run off of. Um, and so if you start straying into those phone bands, people are going to know, and they're going to know fast. And because there's... It, Yeah, but so so the reason I don't the reason that I haven't really done as much work as I'd probably like to on that is because if you straight if you if you're like oh I accidentally you know hit a five instead of a four you know you're into a band that you should not be in and people are gonna know right away so no yeah really I haven't messed nearly as much with that as I have with the 433 plus the hardware is cheaper for the 433 so that's one of the other reasons and and there's a plethora of those devices whereas here in the the UK I think you guys are on 868 is one of your international bands too. Um, and so that's, that's something else to look at if you're looking for a transmitter or some frequency or something like that. Anybody else? It's the weirdest thing you found. <sighs> the, shock, the shock collar was really weird. I mean, that's one of those things that you're like, oh, I think that there should be a little bit more, you know, because I mean, that can cause like actual real harm, right? Uh, the other weird things that I, that I found, uh, There's a lot. There's a lot of control systems out there that should not be there using this. You know, a lot of like, oh, we're going to fail over to this, and by fail over, I mean we're going to use it constantly. You know, to control infrastructure stuff that shouldn't be controlled. Um, and so, so it's one of those things that, you know, it's one of those things you never like when when you think you find something that you're like, oh, this could be really bad. You never want to be like, well, I'm just going to poke it, right? Like it's one of those things, like, yeah. Like, there's a lot of receiving you can do because it's on 434. So, hey, you can absolutely receive it. But when you're like, I think I know what, I'm not going to touch it. So, uh, I think the, the one that I've messed with the most and played with the most is probably dog collar. And that's probably the one from the standpoint of like, oh, this, like, this, could, this could actually like, directly cause some harm. But there's other stuff too that, um, like, they, they have a control mechanism, like remote control mechanisms to turn on like, um, s like smart light switches and stuff like that. And people will have like crazy things hooked up to those. You know, they're like, oh, I have like, you know, the heat lamp for my turtle hooked up to one of those things, you know. And it's like, okay, I get that you can control it, you know, remotely. But like, you could also fry your turtle, you know, take whatever. I mean, there are, there are things like that. But I would say the dog collar is probably the weirdest. Anybody else? All right, awesome. Thank you, guys.